Our scripture reading this morning is from Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. You can find this in the Old Testament in your Bible. So I want to invite you to join me in standing as you're able as we give honor to the reading of God's Word. Again, beginning in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 2. There the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing and yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. In our current sermon series, we are looking at some of the things that God made us all for. We've talked about the fact that God made us for relationship, that God made us for worship. And this morning, we are exploring the idea that God made us to be curious and creative. God made us as human beings to be inquisitive, creative, explorers of our environment and our world. Uh, We can see this most purely and most innocently in our children. Babies and toddlers are constantly exploring their new environment. I never imagined how much of parenthood would simply involve the phrase, don't put that in your mouth. Uh, They are always looking for things and want to see what what it is. And as children get a little bit older... They begin endlessly questioning everything. What are you doing? Why are you doing that? Where's mommy? Who is that? Are we there yet? How much longer? Why is he so fat? Why is she so short? Why why are they so old? Why, 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 why? Children love not only to question but to create. Imaginary worlds, make-believe, arts, crafts, fantastic messes. Kids love to make stuff. Uh, Lucy, our youngest, always wants to be out with me uh, in my workshop. She always wants to make something. She is a girl with a creative heart, uh, but often lacking a plan. She loves to make stuff. Uh, Our curiosity and our creativity seem to be a very natural part of who we are and who God made us to be. From the very first chapter of Genesis, God commissions humankind to have dominion over the earth, to fill it and subdue it, And to have that kind of control and power and authority over something, you have to have some idea of how the whole thing works. There have always been people from the very beginning who have wondered how our world, our universe, our human bodies work. And the things we don't quite understand draw us more deeply into the questions, more deeply into the exploration and the wonder and the awe, and sometimes into ever deeper questions. Scripture is filled with people who had big questions. David in Psalm 8, as he stared up into the night sky at the moon and the stars, the vastness of the cosmos above him, and he ponders, who am I that God is mindful of me? I think many of us tomorrow will be looking up at the sky and wondering the same thing. Who are we that God is mindful of us in the midst of these amazing events that happen in our universe? But it's not just David. Pontius Pilate, during Jesus' trial, asked that great great metaphysical question, what is true? The lawyer who asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Thomas, who we affectionately call Doubting Thomas, but we shouldn't call him Doubt. We should call him Thomas the Scientist. He just wanted empirical evidence. Let me see it, let me touch it, let me feel it before I'm going to believe it. A good mystery always draws us deeper. And God tells us in Scripture that there are some things that we're just not going to understand right now. In John 16, Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. To me, that tells me that there is an idea that God is not done teaching us. That we don't have it all figured out. We don't have the whole plan laid out before us. There is more to learn, more to know, more to explore. Theologians speak to this idea with an overarching term called continuing revelation. The basic premise is that neither Scripture nor our understanding of Scripture is static. It's something that grows and changes over time as we grow in our understanding of God and the world around us. And it all starts with a question. One brave person asking a question. The passage we've read from Exodus this morning is a pretty well-known passage. These verses set the stage for Moses' encounter with God in the burning bush. 
And this is the beginning of God's calling of Moses to go and set the Israelites free in Egypt. But rather than focusing on Moses' mission, I want us to think about what prompts that, what begins that. How did God get Moses' attention? You know, God could have spoken to Moses in a dream or a vision. He could have made a dramatic appearance as a pillar of smoke or a pillar of flame. He does that later in Exodus. God could have gone full-on Wizard of Oz here and really gotten Moses' attention. Instead, God speaks to Moses' natural curiosity. It's not until Moses is actually already turned to investigate that God says, Moses, Moses. He presents this strange and mysterious burning bush on fire and yet not consumed. And Moses decides to investigate. He says, i got to figure out what's happening here. What is this mysterious thing? He is drawn into relationship by mystery and unanswered questions. By curiosity. And what's revealed when we are curious? Answers truth god sometimes more questions but it is curiosity that sets the ball rolling it's what ignites our relationship with god and the ever deepening knowledge that we seek of who he is to us and yet and yet the larger church and religious authorities for countless generations have had a long and difficult history with human curiosity, the suppression of science and truth and discovery, and I can't help but wonder why. Well, we know that curiosity can be dangerous, right? I mean, we know that that was established back in, in Genesis 1 with Adam and Eve, that there are boundaries that sometimes we aren't meant to cross and it can get us in trouble. And we know what happened to the curious cat, right? And we all know from horror movies that investigating a strange noise doesn't always end well. Sometimes our curiosity is not a good thing. And it was easier long ago when there was one person or one organization that defined truth for the masses. Truth was something handed down by a king or by the church. And really the Bible was the only truth that anybody needed. And if it contradicted the Bible, then it wasn't true. And if it contradicted what the church told you was true about Scripture, then it wasn't true. Let me tell you, that worked for a really long time. But then these things called printing presses got invented. And all of a sudden, books and literature and science and the Bible were readily available to people like you and me. Common people like you and me learned how to read. And all of a sudden, all these things were put into the hands of many instead of the hands of few. And Christianity worked really hard to kind of stifle that curiosity, to demean that intellect. History is littered with faithful people like Galileo and Copernicus and Charles Darwin who sought to answer questions that the church rejected as heresy. And there are still people today who are trying to answer big questions as people of faith, people who believe in God, who struggle with the views of church people. I remember a dear friend in a previous church who had studied long and hard getting graduate and postgraduate degrees in the study of climate and weather. Everything she knew, all her data pointed toward climate change being a reality. And as she sat in Sunday school class, she realized one Sunday that she was the only one that believed the things that all of her data had taught her. She spoke about how lonely that was. While we are a few hundred years removed from the religious persecution of science, a certain kind of fear still grips Christianity. A generational fear that if we ask too many questions, God will be displeased with us. A fear that science will somehow disprove our faith. That some questions will lead to a doubt that somehow makes everything around us collapse. That a contradiction found between a science textbook and the Bible will cast doubt on our whole biblical canon. But science and faith are two different ways of understanding our existence. And as the writer and pastor Adam Hamilton once wrote, they are both trying to answer different but important questions. But somewhere in these last 2,000 years of history, Christendom has become more concerned about being gatekeepers of truth rather than people who seek answers to great questions. We 
they became more concerned about preserving rather than exploring. When we do this, we lose track. We lose track of the elegance of what God has created all around us and for us. The vastness of the cosmos, the complexity of our human bodies, the beauty of the earth, the awe that we as human beings are capable of creating and learning more than we ever thought possible. And all the questions that this beauty and wonder create for us. You know, we have the gift of living in this wonderful place called Huntsville. And I feel truly blessed to live here. It really is an amazing place. This hub of science and technology and engineering and exploration and art and culture. As someone once told me when we first moved here, though, you only have to drive 15 minutes in any direction to realize you're still in Alabama. <laughs> there are dueling ideas about just how far we should go, how much we should question. But you know, this city has a long history of pushing through the fear and the risk in the name of exploration and greater understanding. We have always had brave souls who are willing to risk for the sake of discovery. And brave souls like that need a place where they can safely come and ask the big questions without fears of being shouted down. The church should never be a place where you have to check your brain at the door. Because let's face it, there are more PhDs and doctorates in engineering and scientific knowledge in this room than any place I've ever been. The church should be a place where questions are welcome. Discovery, beauty, complexity, and elegance, mystery and truth, all of those things should dance here together. This is the place for questions. This is the place for discovery. But we confess that dance is a slow dance in the church, right? The church is notoriously slow to accept the new, whether it's new interpretation or scientific discovery or cultural changes or simple misreading of Scripture. There are still more people than I can bear that when we mention the name Mary Magdalene, their first thought is, Prostitute! Even though the church has long, long held that that was a misreading of Scripture. And that Mary Magdalene was not. Bible scholars have long held the view that the wise men visited Jesus not in the manger on that Christmas long ago, but in his home later in Jesus' childhood. But I can tell you that I had a former church member who said, I like my nativity set the way it is. I don't like that, so I don't believe it. Just because we don't like something doesn't mean it's not true. Tradition is a stronger force than we often realize. We often hold on to that which we have always done without stopping to wonder why or attempting to ask new questions. If we are slow to accept understanding of our own scriptural tradition, you can imagine that we might be even slower to accept the ideas and theories put forth by scientists and scholars. But the reality for me is that we are all after the same thing. We're all seeking truth in, in different ways. Science asks important questions like, how? How did this come to be? How does this all work? Here in the church, we're asking a somewhat different question. We're asking, why? Why are we here? It seeks to answer the questions of our hearts that ponder our meaning and our purpose in the world and our relationship to one another. But the questions of one do not invalidate the other. They are part of who we are, who we were made to be. And the questions draw us out of the shallows of our faith and into the deeper waters of a life with God. How can that be a bad thing? My prayer as a church family is that we are a place where questions are welcome, where beliefs are welcome. One of the things that I love about our youth group, uh, Josh tells the students that we practice a radical inclusivity. And that means that we do not always agree on everything, but we're going to love each other anyway. We may not all agree on the way that the world was created. We may not all agree on a great number of many different things. But we can agree that our God loves us 
calls us to a deeper understanding, a deeper exploration of this world that he has created for us, and a deeper knowledge of him. Your questions are welcome here. Your doubts and fears are welcome here. 